thank you so much for doing this. I cannot believe I am podcast interviewing doing a legend. You're, you're going to talk to about 10,000 dentists right now, and they're going to sit there and say, how the hell did Howard get score <laughs> this interview with the man? And I got to thank uh, Tom Giacobbe. He interviewed you at the Serona meeting in Vegas, and uh, as a gift to me, he scored me this interview with you. How are you doing, Tony? I'm doing awesome. How about yourself? Very good. Hey, um, I first want to thank you. I got four boys, and we grew up. My I never parked my car in the garage. We had a big wrestling mat out there in a weight gym, and we, my boys, listened to your thirty day personal power while we were working out probably ten times. Wow. Uh, we went to your. Uh, I took them all to your seminar in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, way back in the day. You had a whole auditorium filled with people, and in our family, you're we make the sign of the cross when we say your name. <laughs> you guys are too sweet. I mean, we oh, do. Where, where do you live now? Phoenix, Arizona still. I'm coming to Phoenix. You'll have to come as my guest to a seminar. I'm doing one there next Monday. Well, you tell me and I'm there. But 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 in all seriousness, to this day, my boys are uh, 20, 22, 24, 26. They still drop one-liners that they learned from you their whole life. I mean, you know, you just – you're a huge, uh, huge. But you're talking to a very tight group. You're talking to dentists. Um, you know dentists. They make a lot of money, but, Tony, they're stressed. They're, they're um, you know, when you go to a restaurant, everybody's happy. When you go to Disneyland, everybody's happy. When you go to the dentist, you're mad. You're hurting. You didn't sleep last night. Someone's going to max out your credit card. So I want to talk to you because they're very stressed. They've had a lot of high suicide rates, and a lot of them want to retire. And you kind of fit that whole package because I, I just read your New York Times bestselling book on money. And that was uh, amazing. I have an MBA, and it was amazing if you were a novice kid reading it in college. And it's amazing if you're a 50-year-old with an MBA. So I want to talk the back end of that, but I want to start with the front end. Um, what, what would your advice to be to dentists if they're uh, they're burned out, they're going to work, and you know, and they don't quit because they're making too much money, but they're burned out. They, they you know, the, the patients are upset. They, they got to manage staff. What, what advice would you give to them? Do to, to uh, well, there's two, there's two things. Uh, you know, Fortune Practice Management is a company I started 25 years ago, and I started specifically for dentists. And I would come four times a year, and we'd bring in, I think in those days, 30 dental offices. And I'd have them tell me every problem or challenge they have, and I'd come up with system solutions, everything from the commun communications to how to deal with the clients to how you, you imagine it. So I know, the, I know dentists' world uh, pretty strongly from my past. But I would say there's two things. One is you have to train yourself – to stop thinking like the artist or the dentist, and you've got to decide that you're going to be not just a, a business operator or a dentist, but you're going to become a business owner. And that psychological difference is the difference between being stressed out or not stressed out. Operators are always stressed because everything depends upon them. And when I talk to dentists, they go, well, that's a pipe dream. But I actually take a, I have a five-day process. I take people through of any business, but I have a lot of dentists that go through. It's called business mastery. And what I do is walk them through how to actually run the business where it isn't just you. And that process is more than doable, but it's not part of the mindset as when you're going through school to become a dentist. Most people go because they really love people. This is an area they feel like can make a major difference for people. And even though people are scared of them and, and they want to avoid them because of the process, they still have had some fulfillment except they have the stresses in the business. So one part is learning how to really run a business and really knowing this is a business, that you can change people's lives but still run a business so you can have so everything isn't on your back every single moment. That's a, you know, that's a detailed conversation. But the one I can tell you is the other one is you've got to change your psychology. You know, 80% of success in life is psychology, 20% is mechanics or the how-to or the strategies. And I'm a strategist. I believe in one strategy could save you 10 years, a financial strategy, a business strategy. But unless you have the right psychology, nothing works. So I offer people to think of it this way. If you want an extraordinary life, extraordinary quality of life, life on your terms, not my terms, yours, whatever it is for you. Some people, an extraordinary life is three perfect children. Some people, it's, you know, making a billion dollars. Some people, it's doing things for their church. Everyone has a different idea. But if you want an extraordinary life, you need to master two primary skills in life. One is the science of achievement. How do I take what I dream about and make it real? How do I go from thought to reality? And, and most dentists, if they give themselves credit, there's something in their life. If you're listening right now as a dentist, there's something in your life today that once was a dream, that once was a goal, that once seemed difficult or impossible. Having your own practice might have been that, a relationship you have, a car, a certain level of financial success. But now you have it. How did you go from where you are 
to actually achieving something that once seemed difficult or impossible. Fundamentally, at the most basic level, everybody goes through three steps. And we forget that we are the creators of our lives. We're not the master of our circumstances because we get so caught up in the day-to-day. So how do we do it? Most people, they think of something. Well, what's in your life today that once was you know, a goal or a dream or seemed impossible? And for example, with you, Howard, so we can use you as an example. A dental office, a dental magazine, a dental website, four amazing boys. Great. So let's take let's take your dental magazine as an example. So at one point that seemed difficult or impossible, I assume. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what did you do? How'd you get it? How'd you make it happen? I just did it. I just printed it up and mailed it to all the dentists. The first issue lost ninety thousand. The second issue lost eighty thousand. And by the time it broke even, I was under one million dollars. <laughs> That's awesome. And that's an entrepreneur's pathway. You made, you lost enough money and made enough money to pay for your education. But here's the point. The first thing I guarantee you did is you obsessed about it. You had a goal. You had a desire. You had something that you were so focused on that your mind, your body, everything was geared to really hungry for and you're driven for. Sometimes just thinking about it constantly programs the part of your brain called the reticular activating system, the RAS. And that part of your brain determines what you notice. It's kind of like if you buy a car or an outfit and suddenly you see that car outfit everywhere. They're always around you. But you see them now because this part of your brain that knows what's important is there. So when you decide, this is what I want, and I want it badly, you'll hear a conversation, you'll see things, you'll relate things you never would have noticed. But then the second step, once you have this incredible hunger and this desire, the second step for everybody is to take massive action, which is what you did. It's like, screw it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this. I'm going to send this. I'm going to try this. I'm going to do this. Whether it works or not, I'm going to do it massively. But you got to take massive action, and then, and then what you've got to do is find the most effective execution. you got to find the right way to do it. So you did that. You tried a bunch of things. It cost you a lot. looked like you're going under, but you kept your, your head together, your psychology together, and you found the way to execute. And what's the third thing to achieve what you want? It's really simple. It's a little bit of grace. Some people call it luck. Some people call it God. There's a little bit of grace. But I found grace comes to you when you work your ass off, when you're crystal clear on what you want. So that's achievement in the most simplistic approach. But it's important to remember that we are creators of our lives. But the, the stress is something totally different. Lots of people, Howard, achieve their goals and then say, is this all there is? You know, a lot of people, dentists, will get to where they thought they wanted to be, and then they're still stressed out. And the reason is because the human mind is not designed to make you happy. It's a two-million-year-old brain, and it's designed to make you survive. Happiness is your job. And so most of us never trained how to be happiness. Most of us are wired for, for fear or concern. It's fight or flight is in all of us. And we used to have to be at fight or flight about whether a saber-toothed tiger is going to get us, and that same structure is there. But there's no saber to tiger, so now we worry about what people are going to say about us, or we worry about how much money we have. When any dentist who's listening to this, even someone who's failing, is doing better than 70, 80 percent of the planet living on two, three dollars a day, right? So our idea of survival has changed. Our reaction has changed. So the second master lesson, science of achievements, how you get a great life. The second one is the art of fulfillment. And to succeed without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. And so what you really have to do is you have to literally become an achiever at enjoying your life. And in order to do that, you have to see what gets in the way. And I'll, I'll give you a good example. We have uh, about a year and what, I think it's been four months now, year and five months, we lost what I consider to be a national treasure. And that is Robin Williams. I mean, did you enjoy Robin Williams? Absolutely. Whenever I go around the world, I was just in China, I am Singapore, I was in London, I was in Australia. Everywhere I asked about him, everybody raised their hand, they loved him. Now think about this guy. He was the ultimate achiever. He wanted to make the world laugh. He did it. He wanted his own TV show. He did it. He wanted the number one show. He did it. He wanted to make movies. He did it. He wanted to make a movie and win an Academy Award for not being funny, for being a dramatic actor, which wasn't his skill, and he did it. He wanted a beautiful family, and he did it. And he hung himself. See, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. He made everybody happy but himself because what he did for years is suffer. So I want to give your people, all the dentists out there, Something is so simplistic that I know many of them will just pass it off and not get it. But if they get it, this one little conversation could change their life because I had a conversation like this to change my life. I generated, you know, my companies do $5 billion a year. I have four unbelievable children. I travel all around the world. I have people come up to me every single day in my life and tell me, oh, my God, you changed my life. I hear these beautiful stories. I love What's your life like? Say, you're going to say it's the most magnificent life you can imagine. But. I made a distinction. I actually, a friend of mine from India sat down with me, and the distinction was really simple. In life, there's only two places you can live emotionally. There are states that are beautiful states of mind and emotion, 
and there are suffering states. Now, most of us achievers, most dentists aren't going to say I'm suffering, but a beautiful state is not just happy. A beautiful state could be hungry, driven, creative. It could be excited. It could be focused. It could be determined. Those are all states, and when you're in them, you do the right thing, and you enjoy yourself. Suffering states are frustration, stress, overwhelm, worry, uh, uh, anger, sadness, you know, envy, any of those things that most human beings have. And if you would have asked me before, do I have those emotions? I'd say, sure, I get pissed off, I get angry, I get frustrated, but I don't stay there. I have this amazing life. What's changed for me is I decided that there, I am in control. No one else is responsible. I made a decision that I am 100% responsible for my experience of life, my experience. I can control all the events, but I can control what it means to me. And I've always known this and taught it and practiced it. But what changed for me is I decided my vision for my life, my spiritual vision is I want to have people end suffering. And suffering shows up when you get pissed, frustrated, freaked out, because that's what the human mind does. It always looks for what's wrong. What's wrong is always available. So is what's right. And so what I've trained my mind to do is when I start to feel anything, and I wouldn't call it suffering because achievers don't suffer, right? We're ultimate achievers. You know, we get a little stressed. But I always say to people, stress is the achiever word for fear. You know, what are you stressed about? Oh, I got to do all these things. What if you don't? But I have to. What if you don't? Well, it'll fall apart. What if it falls apart? Then it'll fail. What if it fails? Then I'm a failure. If I follow the trail of your stress, it'll take me to your deepest fear. So here's what I offer them who are stressed out. You have to make the most important, important decision of your life. And that decision is that when you start to feel like you're suffering, that you understand it's about you. It's all you obsessing about yourself. You know, if someone says to me, no, no, I'm depressed because my kids are not doing well. I'm freaked out about my kids. No, you're freaked out that you failed your kids. It's about you. You know, people are always worried about something they're going to lose or something they lost or something they're never going to get. And whenever we start doing that, we feel frustrated or pissed off or angry or sad, and we blame something. We blame other people, we blame events, or we blame ourselves. Blaming yourself doesn't change anything. It just puts you in a lousy state. It makes you suffer more. So what I've decided is really simple. Every day of my life, I, if I, suffering will arise, meaning frustration, anger, sadness, whatever, it'll arise. That's like the sun arises, but I kill it when it arises. I kill that monster while it's a baby. I don't wait till it's Godzilla taking the city. And so I become obsessed with I won't suffer. I'm not going to live in the future. I'm not going to live in the past. I, if I can't find ecstatic feelings, ecstasy, joy, happiness in this moment, then more accolades, more impact, more achievement, more money, more children, more life is not going to give you more either. You have to master the moment. And that experience has transformed myself, my wife, and it's a decision. I tell people, there's lots of things going to happen in your life you can't control. I mean, you may go through a divorce, even if you're a good person, or you could lose a family member to cancer or heart disease, or you could be in a position where the government changed the rules and all of a sudden your business would change radically. I think decisions like who are you going to spend time with, who are you going to love? Who are you going to marry? Some of the most important decisions of your whole life. But the most important decision is not to suffer and to live in a beautiful state. Because if something happens and you're always reacting to it, from a reaction place, you're not going to solve the problem anyway, and you're going to be in a lousy state. So I'll give you an example. A friend of mine in India started, there's a, there's, I can't even pronounce it, but there's a sport there that for a thousand years Indian people have played in their villages as little kids. He made it a professional sport three years ago. In a year, his team, which I think he, he spent like $10, $20 million to develop, was worth $400 million. And they went to the championship of this sport. And in India, 500 million people watch this sport that has only been a professional sport for three years. His, his, his profitability went through crazy. Everything's great. So I'm with him, and he gets a phone call. And the people that are the best players in the world used to be like construction workers. He went out and found these people, and now half a billion people watch them, and they're superstars in the media and everything else. And two or three of them he recruited are the best in the country. And he gets a phone call that says they have signed with another team because they tripled their salary. And you could just see him getting so frustrated and angry. What was it about? Immediately it was about himself. He's like, how could they do this to me? They used to work on a construction site. I made them famous. I changed their lives. All this suffering, me, 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 me. And he's like, my team won't win next year because they lost the best players. And, and, and you know, because we're not going to be the number one team anymore. And all this happened in the middle of it. He caught himself and he said, look at this. I'm obsessing about myself. I'm obsessing about the future of the past. All I need to do is come back to the center of the truth is I'm here to appreciate something in this moment. I'm here to give something. I'm here to learn something. I'm here to love or be grateful for something. And in doing that, 
what happens immediately is the suffering disappears. And then he could just say, okay, I'm not suffering anymore. What do I need to do? I need to hire some new players. I need to move on. So I know this sounds esoteric, but it's the most valuable thing I can tell you that I have learned in my life in 38, going to be 39 years doing this around the world. I meet billionaires and they're suffering. And I've always known it. I help them turn their business around. They turn them around. But if you can just discipline yourself to say, if I'm not feeling feelings I don't want, what am I feeling and what am I focusing on? It's something about me. And the antidote to that is one of three things. Appreciate something outside yourself. It gets you out of your head. Hard to enjoy something at first if you're suffering, but appreciate then enjoy. Second, what can I learn from this? How can I grow from this? Because when you learn and grow, there's no suffering. The third one, who can I love? What can I give? Or what can I be grateful for? If you would just make the decision that says, I am going to live in a beautiful state no matter what, even if it rains on my parade, you know, life is too short to live in stress. Life is too short to suffer. If death was coming for you, Howard, today, you'd want to negotiate. You'd say, give me a week. And death would say, I gave you 52 weeks this year. What the hell did you do with them? <laughs> right? And so my view is I will not suffer. And if I see other people suffering, I want to give them the tools to change that. And every dentist can learn those tools. I'm trying to, in this quick little conversation is stimulate them to think there's a decision you can make, drawing a line in the sand that says, I'm just, I'm just not going to go there. I'm not going to waste my energy and time. If there's a real problem, I'll solve it. But I'm not going to sit here and stress out about it. That's, that's the core of what's necessary to get out of stress long term forever. Tony, every time we poll Dennis and say, what is the number one stress in your life? They say staff. They say it's so frustrating. They, they studied eight years, math, physics, chemistry, and now they're trying to lead a hygienist, assistant, receptionist. What advice would you give them so that the staff doesn't stress them out and they can be a better leader like you? Um, I have um, you know 18 companies that I'm directly involved with. I manage eight or nine really directly, very intensely. Uh, I'm on stage all the time. I travel. Last year I was on a plane, but once every four days on a plane or on stage somewhere in the world in 13 countries. So I learned early on that all your pain, all your suffering is coming from expectation. You're expecting people to be different than they are. You're expecting people to do all the right things. You're expecting them to follow through. And it seems like a reasonable expectation. But the truth of the matter is people are going to do what they do. So the first step is better hiring. First step is really getting someone's nature, like defining the DNA of the job, not only in their ability to do the job, but what's their psychology like? How do they deal with stress and finding people? Because I found in my life, it's not the person you hire, it's the person you fail to fire that really hurts you. So it's like deciding who's right and going for it. But even with that, with so many moving parts, with so many moving people, I know people are going to screw up. I don't get pissed off. I don't get freaked out about it. I know it's going to happen. I've trained myself. I might start to feel it. Like I used to get so frustrated all the time. And so I remember one time somebody came to me as early in my career in one of my companies and they said, uh, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I don't know how to tell you this. Tell me what? Tell me what? Um, we've lost $125,000. And this is the days when my companies weren't doing billions. They were probably doing a million and a half dollars gross, right? And I'm like, what? And I go crazy. I go berserk. And of course, that makes people not want to tell you for the longest period of time because they're avoiding conflict. It doesn't solve anything. So after a while, I realized this wasn't working. So I created this new trigger for myself, which is someone said, we lost $125,000. That's fascinating. <laughs> I said, I'm completely fascinated how you could do that. Can you explain to me how that's happened? And while I'm doing this fascinating, making myself break my pattern and my humor, the other person doesn't, doesn't feel quite as freaked out. And what happens is in staying in a beautiful state instead of a suffering state, an angry state, a reactive state, you can get to the solution. We found the money, right? And we figured out how the money got lost, and we figured out how to make sure that won't happen again. So part of it for the doctors is hiring more effectively. But the other part of it is trade your expectation for appreciation, and you'll have a completely different life right now. Because you're expecting people to do all the right things. I'm excited. Here's what I expect. People are going to do what they do. And I'm going to hire better and better people, and even the best people are going to screw up. I'm capable of screwing up, and what I'm going to do is understand that i got enough systems, enough backup, that nothing is life and death. You know, the whole thing of, you know, don't sweat the small stuff, it's all small stuff. And by living that way, I'm not lowering my standard. I still am committed, I'm still driven, I'm still making sure we follow through, but I'm just not reactive. And so I don't have the problem in me. I'm sure your doctors know, because I'm sure they've studied that all it takes is two minutes of agitation, of frustration, anger, and that stays in your body for approximately four to five hours. 
I mean, literally, there's a residue of that in your body. The way your heart moves, the way your adrenaline is functioning, there's a biochemical change. But you can also stack good things. You can take little things and stack them one after another after another. So one of the things I do, so I'm better with people than I possibly can, I train them, I reinforce them, I know they're going to screw up, I'm very connected to them, they want to support, they want to move forward, they feel like they're in a very beautiful, fair environment. I look for solution system solutions. But the other thing I do is every single day of my life, I start my day by what I call priming. I take 10 minutes, and there's never a day I don't do this. I made a deal with myself. I said, if you don't have 10 minutes for yourself, you don't have a life. And I go outside, you know, the first thing in the morning, and I put some music on, and all I do is focus on three things for 10 minutes. And, you know, usually I'm so in state, it'll usually last 12 or 15 or even 20. And I do this breathing pattern that I teach, which is an explosive breath. You take a breath in, and you blow it out, you know, like this. I do 30 of those three times in a row, close my eyes, put on the music, and I spend three and a half minutes just focusing on what I'm grateful for. And I think of three specific items I'm grateful for, and I think of one – I make one something really simple, like the wind on my face or the smile on my son's face, something really simple, but I step in like I'm there feeling the gratitude. Now, why do I do this? It's not a positive thinking technique. When you're grateful, you can't be angry. When you're grateful, you can't be frustrated. So when you're grateful, it changes the biochemistry that's going on in you. So I deliberately put myself in that biochemical state to start every day for three and a half minutes, and I do it in a way where I'm like, I don't remember something I'm grateful for over there, like remembering going on a roller coaster over there. I imagine I'm going over the top of the roller coaster in the front seat. I step into what I'm grateful for and feel it. I have thanks for my health, for the family, for everybody around me, and I just see energy going through my body, healing, solving any problem needs to be solved, corny as it sounds, and then I send that love and energy to everyone else. It creates even deeper compassion, gets you outside yourself. And then I do three minutes on what I call my five, three to five to thrive. I pick three to five things that I really want to achieve. I see each one as accomplished. I experience the enjoyment and the joy of it. And I'm done in 10 or 12 minutes. But what happens is most people have a dirt road to happiness. And they got a highway to pissed off, a highway to frustration, a highway to stress. And I guarantee most of your dentists, by the nature of their environment, have gotten themselves wired to be stressed. You can dewire that. And you can create a highway to happiness. And I don't hope that's going to show up. People say, you know, Yo, you seem so happy all the time. Are you naturally happy? Or don't you have bad days? I used to say, well, of course I have bad days. I don't really anymore. I might have bad 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And it's not phony and fake. It's just I won't tolerate it. And also because I start every day by wiring myself. So the more you do this, the more you wire yourself to feel those great feelings, the more you get there. It's like you have, you've, got, you've got instant access because whatever you do in your nervous system, as you know, neurologically, you get wired to do. So that's a few ways I would attack it. Tony, my favorite TED Talk was actually yours. Will you talk about that? I want these dentists to go home and, uh, and do that TED Talk. How, what made you do a TED Talk? And uh, Seriously, that's my favorite TED Talk, well, and I've watched you. a thousand of them. Well, thank you. Well, it's, it's rated one of the top ten. It's in the top ten of the, what, 100,000 TED Talks they got or more, um, and – uh, uh, Quincy Jones, a dear friend of mine, he invited me to come and said, would you come do this TED Talk? I, I didn't really want to do it. I was busy, but he said, please, please come. And I got there, and then they told me the talk was 18 minutes. Now, my shortest seminar is like four days. <laughs> so Because I want to go deep, you know, and I don't just want to talk. I want people to do things so they get it in their body so they're wired. So 18 minutes I've never done in my life. So I got up there, and, and uh, the first thing I did is like, the guy who's introducing me, who's now a friend of mine at the time was not, he's like, oh, but please don't get people jumping around and stuff. And I have people move because sitting still and learning the traditional way is not only so boring, but there's no energy in your body. So I believe it should be like a rock concert. And when it is, it is you learn at a different level. You learn where you're going to use what you learn because you're active instead of passive like most people learn. So I thought I've got to engage these people and get them jumping. So I just asked them all a question. I said, you know, i got a question. Who here has ever failed? Now, this room in those days, there was no TED Talks on, on, on the web. No one knew what it was. The only people there was only 800 people, and they were all, like, billionaires, the founders of Google. You know, uh, Steve Jobs was there. All these people that are the who's who in the world of tech were there in the investment community. I said, who here has ever failed? Nobody raised their hand. <laughs> I said, I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. Who here has ever failed? And again, most people raised their hand. I said, well, when you failed, why did you fail? And 
their voices came out. Somebody said, well, we didn't have the right technology. And someone else said, we didn't have enough time. And someone else said, we didn't have enough capital. And someone else said, you know, I had the wrong people. And I said, that's funny. Your people told me you had the wrong leader. You know, I kind of teased them. And then I heard a voice in the darkness as this dark room Ted was done. And the voice said, I didn't have enough Supreme Court justices. And I looked down and it's Al Gore, Vice President Al Gore. And everybody starts <laughs> clapping because, you know, it's Northern California, it's a Democratic community, you know. And I said, well, that's one way to explain why you didn't become president of the United States. But I said, I want to ask everybody a question. I said, everything you told me why you failed was a lack of a resource, not enough money, not the right contacts, not the right technology, not enough time. It was all resources. I said, but I found that resources are never the problem if you're resourceful enough. And I get four, four or five great examples from, you know, Sam Walton on down who didn't have the resources, but they were resourceful. So they got it all because the ultimate resource is human emotion. If you're creative enough, you get the answer. If you're determined enough, you can get the money. Right. There's always a way if you're in the right state. So I turned back to Al Gore and I said, you know, I watched you last night give a talk and you've given this talk on the environment, you know, inconvenient truth. It was the first time you'd ever given it. And he was so passionate. And I said, Vice President Gore, I said, I watched you last night. I said, I watched you in the debate with George Bush, and I said, I couldn't vote for you. I mean, you're just, I, even if I wanted to, I couldn't vote for you. I said, but the guy I saw last night, he could have set the world on fire. And everybody started clapping like crazy. I said, you didn't lose because there weren't Supreme Court justices. I said, you lost because you had to go to the Supreme Court because you didn't do the job up front because you didn't inspire America. And everybody, he looked at me like kind of freaked out, and all of a sudden everybody starts clapping like crazy, and he came by and gave me a high five. And it kind of started this whole process where I show people in that TED Talk that it's never what you think it is. It's never the outside world. It's in you. When you change what's in you, you'll change the impact of the environment. Okay, Tony, I want, I want a really serious question. Um, these kids are coming out of dental school, 25 years old, $350,000 in debt. Yeah. You, and they're scared. And you just wrote a New York Times bestselling book on money. What would you tell these kids with 350000 at age 30 and under um, – could they be a millionaire at 65? Oh, they can, do it, they can do it much earlier than 65. The millionaire today um, is a very limited amount of capital, uh, quite frankly. But I interviewed 50 of the smartest people alive financially. I mean, people that uh, John Paulson is, uh, he made $5 billion a couple of years ago. In one year, he made $4 billion personally, not his company, personally the previous year. Uh, he's the third most successful investment guy in history. I haven't given an interview in 15 years. I got the first interview with him. I interviewed uh, Ray Dalio, the number one hedge fund guy in the world, like a huge hedge fund, rich people give their money to a hedge fund, a big hedge fund would be like 10 billion, 15 billion. He's 160 billion. When I was there, the prime minister, minister of China called for coaching. So what I did is I asked them, I went to these people and said, can you still win this game? Can the average person win? And how? What they walked me through was fundamentally, there are seven steps that people go through, but just to give you a taste. The most, there are a couple of decisions that you've got to make early on. If you make it early on in your career, wealth and financial wealth anyway is easy. The first one we all know, but very few people practice, and that is you have to understand the power of compounding. Everybody knows it intellectually, but they don't get what the impact is. Uh, I, I interviewed um, a professor who created, most people know at this point they've heard of, of uh, you know, everybody knows about an active mutual fund versus an index. The man I interviewed uh, is the gentleman who created the first index funds. And now trillions of dollars go into index funds. He's just really, truly brilliant. He wrote a book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street. And uh, I'm having this conversation with him. He said, Tony, I said, what's the most important thing to teach anybody financially? He said, Tony, you know it. He said, it's understanding compounding. And then he gave me this little story as a, a, a metaphor. He said, you know, there's two guys. He said, two brothers, William and James. And William decides to start saving money at, you know, 25 years old. And he saves $300 a month, 4000 bucks a year, basically. And he puts it in the market and lets it grow. And it grows at 10%. And it's, you know, it's not being taxed. It's staying in the market, right? And he said, and it grows. And he, he does it for 20 years till he's 40 years old or 20, 45 years old. And so for 20 or 20 to 40 is what he said. And so in 20 years, he's putting in $80,000, right? 4000 a year, 300 bucks a month. His brother doesn't start till he's 40. But he does it till he's 65. So he does it for 25 years, $300 a month, 4000 a year. So his brother put in 100 grand, he put in 80,000 and stopped at 40. Which one has more money at age 65? Well, it's not hard to figure out. Everyone's going to go, obviously, the guy started earlier. But what most people don't know is the one who started earlier has 2.5 million. And his brother, who put more money in the system but waited, has $450,000. 
That's how big the difference is in compounding. So the most important thing is for you to take a percentage of what you earn in your business and put it aside. Now people say, I can't do that. I have all this debt. I have this. I have no money to do it. I'll give you an example. There's a gentleman um, named Theodore Johnson who worked for UPS. He never made more than $14,000 a year in annual income. He was a driver in the 1950s. When he retired, he had $70 million. He gave away $35 million while he was alive. $70 million never made more than $14,000. How the hell do you do that? He took his money and he created a tax. A friend of his said, I know you have no money at fourteen grand a year. I know you can't afford to pay your bills. But if the government came in and said, Mr. Dentist, or in this case, Mr. Theodore, we're going to add a 20% tax to you. You would scream, you'd yell, and you'd have to find a way to pay it, and you would. He said, I want you to create a tax where you're the collector and you're collecting for your future. So he saved 20%. He made it automated. So he never saw the money, came right off the top, and went straight into his investment account. And that is the single most and simple thing that anybody can do. And even if they think they can't put aside 10% or whatever the case may be, they can put aside 5%. And then every time they get a little bit more profitability, they can add another 5% until they get to a number like 15 or 20%. If you, you save that, and then you do the second thing. The second decision is, it doesn't matter whether you put money in Apple or buy a piece of real estate. What I've learned from all these investors is, asset allocation is 90% of your success or failure in investing. And asset allocation is big words. It just means, how are you going to divide your money up? We all know diversification is the only free lunch. But you don't put all your eggs in one basket. But my bet is most of these dentists are going to put all their eggs in their dental basket. Because, of course, I got so much debt there. I got so many things there. But it's a giant mistake. Early in my career, Ken Blanchard, who wrote the One Minute Manager books, pulled me aside. And I was just coming out with one of my books. And he said, Tony, don't put that book in the company. Let the company get the leads, get the people that are interested. But that money should be set aside in a nest egg. You don't let anything touch. Because your business will always consume whatever amount of money you make available to it. So it's like, you've got to just cut it off. This is the tax. This is where it goes. And so I would say, I'd say you've got to come up with a percentage that you're going to take out even if you owe debt, no matter what, and you'll find out. Your brain will find a way to adjust, and you will find a way to succeed, get more clients, do whatever it takes to do it when it's a must, not a should. But then you've got to decide where to put it. And a little too complex to try and explain here, but someone could pick up my book, and I explain the simple bucket theory. Some of that money's got to be really secure. Some of the money you're going to put at risk in order to grow faster. Some of it's going to lead to your dreams. But in the book, I took Ray Dalio, the most successful investor in history. They call him the Steve Jobs, literally, of investing. To give you an idea, 10 years ago, you had to have a $5 billion net worth and $100 million to give him to have him even talk to you. Now, after 10 years, he won't take anybody's money. So I convinced him to tell me the exact formula where he puts his personal money for his family. And it's a system that is better than anyone's in the world. In, in the last 75 years, it's made money 85% of the time. And the 15% of the time when it didn't make money, if you can imagine, the most it ever lost was 3.9%. Think about all these drawdowns in the stock market of 50% in 2000, 50% in 2008. Think of the last 75 years of what's happened. If you could go to Vegas and you could be right 85% of the time, and when you're wrong, the most you lose is 4%, and your average upside is 10%, you'd gamble all day long. Well, he actually has that strategy, and any dentist could pick it up. So if you just did those two things as a starter, you'd be way ahead of the game from anyone else. And I know what they're going to be thinking. <clears throat> Should they be saving even though they have student loan debt? Yes. Student loan debt today, if they go and negotiate, they can get it down at really low rates. You need to make sure that along the way, you're starting to build something up because there'll be a compounding of the money to put aside. And the bottom line of where we are today is, if all you do is pay off your student loan debt, then you're out of debt, but you don't have any upside. You have nothing to look forward to. Something crazy. You want to pay your debt down. You have to. But you want to do it at a rate that doesn't destroy you. You want to negotiate for the best rate possible. There's firms now by the will to do that for you, help you negotiate the best possible price of the government and re revamp it so the price point's low. You want to go out and get a return where you can see returns are 10 or 15, where the interest rate you might be paying today might be 6%, 5%. Some of these programs they have go even lower. Are you still working with Fortune Management a lot? Yes. I found it 25 years ago. That's why I was at uh, Serona at that point. I was doing a talk for them as well. I, I, I want to end on one thing. I know you're the busiest man. I don't want to be greedy keep you for your time. Um, my last question is this. They study eight years, math, physics, chemistry. And now I got to, they 
the word they hate the most is sell. I'm a doctor. I don't want to sell you. But they know the ones that are most successful can convince you to get treatment. How do you neuro-linguistically program a dentist's mind to say, because selling is the dirtiest four-letter word in, in, in dentistry, and, and they don't want to sell, but I think if they don't convince you to get treatment, you're not a good dentist. So how do you, how do you reframe that to where they can sell dentistry? I, I, I personally don't think of it as sales. I think if you think of it as sales, you'll always have a bad taste in your mouth. I think of it as leadership. What does a leader do? A leader's job is to influence the thoughts, feelings, emotions, and actions of another human being. If you know what your craft is, if you know the value of what you can take care of someone, and we all know, you know, I've had some dental work, as you can tell, that what happens inside the mouth can determine whether or not you have a heart attack these days, right? We've got different level of research to know what this affects. It affects the entire system. If you know that and you don't find a way to break through someone's fears about time or the fears about the treatment or the fears about money or whatever it is, you're not a, you're not a salesman. You're not even a dentist. You're a person that's not leading. Your job in becoming a dentist is lead people to a greater level of health and vitality and ideally maybe self-esteem and beauty. But the very minimum is that. And so you have to get completely associated to what you're, you're doing something for the client. If you think you're doing it for you, there's this little internal piece inside of all of us that creates a tension that clients feel and you feel and it feel bizarre. It's like I would tell people the truth. Say, listen, I am not a salesman. If I was a dentist, I'm not a salesman. I can't sell for squat. But I got to tell you something. This has, has got to be done for you. Let me explain to you the consequences of all this. And I can't let you out of my office with integrity, with any caring about you whatsoever, without you knowing you've got to get this done. If you don't do it with me, you want to go with someone else, I'm fine. But it's got to get done. And here's why I think you'd want to do it with me, because I can do this, this, and this, and this. It, it comes down to owning the value of what you're delivering to people and understanding that if you don't deliver it, if you accept their objections, their no's, their, their fears, they're putting it off, you're hurting them. And if you get that, you'll break through anybody. But calling it selling is a kiss of death because none of us want to be. What's a salesman? We think of a salesman, the white shoot salesman sells used cars. I have no interest in that whatsoever. But I do have interest in impact. I do have an interest in making a difference in people's lives. I do have an interest in pushing people. And listen, I get I got to push people to do things they never thought they'd ever do in a million years. But that's why they come back and thank me. And the same thing will happen with the dentist when they push them through. So, Tony, talk about the company that you're working with now as far as retirement planning. And what made you get into that? You started a retirement uh, pension plan company, or what, how would you describe it? It's called America's Best 401K. It actually came about because when I was doing research on the book, Jack Bogle started Vanguard, which is a $3.5 trillion company now, trillion with a T, a genius of man, been in the business 65 years, a man of such integrity. He said, Tony, I know you're sincere and want to help people. He said, you got to remember, Sarkin. He said, their money is in their home and it's in their 401k. And he said, you know, most people just don't understand how they're being ripped off in their 401k. Go do the research. It'll blow your mind. So I did the research and I found some interesting things. You got an industry. You know, we used to have pensions and now pensions are gone for 95% of Americans. So 401k was supposed to be, you know, for wealthy people to add to their pension. It was supposed to be a supplemental approach, but it became the foundation because it was cheaper for companies. So now what's happened is for 30 years, the industry did not have to legally tell you what they charged you. Could you imagine being in a business where you have everybody's money, you don't have to tell them what you charge them, you just send them statements and you keep collecting whatever you want. That's how it worked up until three and a half years ago. The Department of Labor three and a half years ago came along and said, you have to tell people what you're charging them. So now what these firms do, the biggest firms in the world, the principals, the one we had, there's all kinds of companies, right? Big brand names. They come in now, Fidelity, whoever, and they give you a 35 to 50 page disclosure document to show you what you're being charged, but you need a PhD in finance to figure it out. There's no way you're going to do it. So what I did was I said, this is bullshit. They're ripping people off. And the average person, by the way, pays 3.1% in fees on their 401k. Now, most people say, no, I'm paying 1%. That's the front part of the sticker. There's all these hidden fees. There's 17 hidden fees that you wouldn't even know about. So that's the average, according to Forbes. 3.1%, let me give you a, a context. Let's say you're a 35-year-old as, as a dentist. Let's say you got $100,000 you accumulated. And you put the $100,000 towards your retirement, and it's in the stock market, and it grows at 7% a year. In 30 years, if you're paying 1% in fees, you'll have $762,000. dollars $100 goes to almost eight hundred. dollars Pretty amazing, right, without adding anything to it. But if you pay 3% in fees, you got $432,000. In other words, you have 77% more money if you have the same stocks, the exact same product, 
but you just have less fees because there's a compounding of these fees and people don't, don't understand that. It's kind of like there are companies, we, we, I wanted to create a transparency here. So I created a website called showmethefees.com. America's best 401k or showmethefees.com, either one. If you go there, you can type in your company or you can type in your dental practice and you can say, here's the company we use. And it'll spit out for you how much you're really seeing in fees and show you what that one or 2%, which sounds like nothing, cost you and your team over the next 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. So I brought in this company, had them look at one of my first education companies. It was a small little company I had. And within a day, we got all the same stocks, all the same investments, but the fees were cut by 80%. It put $5 million directly in the pockets of all of my staff, right? So their, their retirement is completely different. And we didn't change any of the stocks. All we did was get rid of the company overcharged, and it kind of cost nothing to convert. So I said to these guys, I want to promote you. I want to be your partner. So I got on their board, and I invested in them. So now I'm a partner in America's Best 401k. And we were on the cover of uh, 401k specialist, Jack Bogle and myself in Vanguard. And I was just awarded by uh, Worth, you know, Worth has this power 100. And they just came out with 100 most influential people in finance in the world. And I'm named number 49, which blows my mind. I'm up there with Ray Dalio and these guys. But it's because we're disrupting this space. We're showing people how to transform their financial world by understanding what's going on. Now, doctors, many of them have different forms of their own individual retirement plans. But uh, I'm going to be announcing in four weeks uh, a new association I have with one of the most amazing firms on the planet, one of the highest rated firms on the planet. Uh, but in the meantime, if they go to America's Best 401k, they can analyze that. And if they're America's Best 401k, if they don't have a 401k, but they have one of the other types of retirement plans that doc dentists have, they can guide them through it as well. And they'll just show them what the fees are and show them how to change it. I've never met anyone personally who knows how much fees are 401k is charging. <laughs> I did I've never two, met a single person. I did 200 interviews in about a year and three months around this book because it became the number one New York Times bestseller. And... I think I found two people that knew their fees and one was wrong. <laughs> it's like you an idea out of 200. And these are people, many of them in the financial business, they just don't know how to read it. But I'll give you an example. Most companies, dentists, people like that will be told, we can't get you those, you know, most people know or have heard that mutual funds are not the place to put your money. And the reason is, and, you know, I, I got this from, you know, David Swenson, he's the Chief Investment Officer of Yale, right? $1 billion to $24 billion, he grew them. He's one of the smartest men alive. A Warren Buffett told me the exact same thing. 96% of all mutual funds fail to match the market over any 10-year period of time. 96%. So you go, I'm going to find the four good ones that do a little better. It's not going to happen because they're always changing. And I'll give you a metaphor. Do you play blackjack? Do you ever play blackjack? Blackjack, yes. Yeah, so you know that you play, it's a 21. If you go over 21, you're busted, you lose, right? It's got to be below 21 to win, but close to 21 as you can. If you get two face cards worth 20, and your inner idiot says, hit me, <laughs> you have an 8% chance of getting an ace. You have a 4% chance of getting the right mutual fund. So what you really want are index funds, like Vanguard. But most 401k providers say, we can't do that, you're not big enough. It's totally false. America's Best 401k will take you to Vanguard. But the ones that do take you, if you dig into the disclosure statement, which is what our company does, you'll see that many of them, we saw one just the other day, they're charging 1.5% for Vanguard. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but Vanguard only costs 0.05%. So they're charging you a 1,000 times more money. Would you like to have a Honda Accord for $30,000 or would like to have a Honda Accord for a million dollars? That's the difference we're talking about. And there are people, there are dentists all over and people around you who have the same product, but they're paying five and ten times more money. So you got to know what they are. Go to show to showmethefees.com or check out America's Best 401k, and they can help you out. Would they, Would you recommend they read your your book first? Tell them tell them your book. My book is called Money Master to the Game: Seven Simple Steps to Financial Freedom. You can pick up anywhere, and and uh, yeah, you can read the chapter on 401k. But I'd go pick up the book for sure. And by the way, I donated all the profits in this book in advance. I was fed when I was 11 years old. Our family had no money and no food and it was Thanksgiving. And so if somebody came and fed our family. It touched me deeply and I promised myself I'd get back. So when I was 17, I fed two families and I thought I'm going to double it every year. That was four and that was eight. Then I got my companies involved when I was just getting started. But over the last, you know, uh, I guess what I've been doing this now in 38 years, going on 39 years, I fed 42 million people up until last year. And I started feeding 4 million people a year, 2 million through my foundation and 2 million I matched. And the last year when I was writing this book and interviewing these billionaires, I watched the, where they cut food stamps by $8 billion, which means every family in need would lose one meal a month 
for 12 months unless somebody else stepped up. So I went to Feeding America, which is the most efficient group in the world for feeding people in the United States. And I said, if I gave it all the money for this book and I got $5 million advance and then some, you know, how many people are going to feed? And they said, you could feed 10 million people. And I was like, I'm in. And then I raised it. So I said, I'm going to feed 50 million. So I can tell you, I just found out yesterday, we fed 102 million people last year alone. And I'm going to do another 75 million this year. Um, and, uh, and I'm working, by the end of this year, I'll feed a quarter of a billion people. I'll feed half a billion by my five-year mark. And at the 10-year mark, I'll feed, feed a billion. So if you get the book, all the money goes to feeding people while you're learning how to transform your life as well. And last question, who do you want to be the president of the United States? <laughs> I'm not going to step into that one. <laughs> All I can tell you is it's fascinating. I know uh, Donald Trump quite well. Uh, he's quite a character. It's fascinating to see how he's used the media the way he has. And, uh, you know, Bill Clinton has been a client of mine and friend of mine for many years. So uh, it, may be, it may come down to those two, which will make it very interesting for me. Tony, you've been a legend for me, my family, my personal family, every dentist I know. Thank you so much for all that you've done for everyone. It's been an honor to have you as a guest. Thank you so much.